And what is about to be presented is actually based on my own personal uh, teaching experiences in primary, secondary, and tertiary institutions here in Guyana and in Barbados. The first thing I would like to define would be art education. Art education is about the training of two kinds of persons. It is the visual artist, and it is also the art historian or critic. Um, for the visual artist, you have to deal with what is required in order to present material in two dimensions, drawing, painting, etching on paper, canvas, and so on, and in three dimensions, which would involve things like sculpture and ceramics and, uh, and constructions. One thing is certain, and that is you cannot teach art. So really, um, to refer to yourself as an art teacher is a bit of a, a, a kind of a close your eyes, shut your eyes and see it kind of thing. You cannot teach art. What you do actually is to expose children to the principles and practices of art. In, in, in art education, you're dealing with the technicalities. So you have to specialize training. You have to deal with um, the mysteries of using line, uh, color, shape, two-dimensional forms, three-dimensional uh, textures, and how those things come together to enable you to present a certain uh, work of art. Um, the person who's going to be into, into writing about art will also have to be aware of what those terms mean and how they operate in order to be able to write clearly and efficiently about what it is they're writing about, paintings or sculpture. The people who are involved in art education are usually artists themselves who have a, a feeling for and an understanding of what it is they are teaching. At least you hope so. The people who are into visual education do not necessarily have to be artists, but they do have to become aware of the tools used by the artists. What lines, mass, color, shape, and texture are used for and what effects they produce. They have because in, in teaching visual education, what you are really doing is not teaching about art. What you're doing is trying to transfer the techniques and the terms used in art to whatever subject is being taught in order to expand the awareness of that, of that subject, in order to give it more material to enable the students uh, to deal with it. In primary education at the teacher's training college, at one time, you had people like Burroughs and Basil Hines who were instructing those teachers about art. But my experience was in primary schools, I taught at the Sacred Art School, which had a number of, of very good uh, um, graduates, first class trained graduates and teachers training college, they were teaching there, but none of them attempted any kind of artwork in their classes. The other thing to consider is that the schools were not prepared for it anyway, because there were no brushes, there were no paints or anything like that. So the schools themselves were not prepared. The school I taught, Sacred Art School, they did have supplies, they did have watercolor sets. But 
the teachers were not allowed to use those watercolor sets until the examiner, the school inspector came around because the school inspector had to see that you are involved in all of the subjects on the syllabus, which included not art, but on the syllabus, it was called drawing. So then all the sets come out and people are shown trying to get the children, oh, draw this or paint this, you know, which is crazy. Now, at secondary, in secondary schools, again, no art teachers. So the subject just disappears. So where art education is concerned, it is virtually a, 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 a no, no. It, it didn't really, it really did not happen until the borough school um, uh, was, was open. Parents did not want their, their children to be wasting time doing art. Art was on the syllabus. And so um, I used to have boys during their lunch break or coming back early, coming to the art room to do my homework. And I said, excuse me, this is supposed to be homework, not class. So they said, but sir, we can't do it at home. I said, why not? Parents object, you're wasting your time. You will not be able to make money as an artist, which is quite true. But what was being overlooked was the fact that by engaging the students to understand about textures and colors and shapes and forms, you're actually broadening the horizons and you're also making them more aware of their environment. An example, children, whenever they're told to draw houses or, or draw me the houses on your street or the house where you live or something like that, these houses will end up with chimneys. And I used to wonder about, I never told them to stop doing it. I used to wonder, why are they doing the same? And then one day it struck me. I told them to draw, um, to draw a house near to them. Their neighbor's house, not their, their neighbor's house. Came up with this lovely painting of a house, flower garden, flowers in the garden, and the window blinds, and the chimney. So I said in a loud voice to the entire class could hear, I said, oh, this is a wonderful baker shop you've drawn here for me. The boy said, no, no, sir, not a baker shop. I said, like, why is there a chimney? A chimney says that this is a baker shop. I said, now go to the window and look through the window in the art room. You can see Georgetown. You show me or identify one building with a chimney that is not a baker shop. They couldn't. And from that day onwards, I never had houses anymore. <laughs> anymore with chimneys, you see. So it was, it was a case of that, what you are teaching so-called within the, within the art class or the session, that it has serious implications to what is happening outside of the room. So the activity was seen as something which was only within the confines of the room and it had no applications outside of the room. Or St. Stanislaus, first art lesson, I came into the room, the boys are sitting there. I walked with a large sheet of white paper. They're watching me. I pinned the paper onto, onto the blackboard. They're still watching. And then I went outside and I picked a vine, the baby pumpkin, you know, a baby pumpkin vine, baby pumpkins on it and the leaves, pinned it on the paper and said, okay, paint or draw that and shut down. Consternation, you could see it in their eyes and whispering, what is he doing? But at the end of that class, I was able to immediately identify students who had an artistic gift and those who did not. And on the basis of that, I was able then to create activities in the classroom that would engage everybody's attention. Um, Burbage High School, teaching whatever. And I used to tell the girls who were doing home economics, I said, um, you know, in your home economics class, why don't you try to design menus which are based on color? Yeah, they said, yeah, okay. I said, what about um, designing a menu based on the color purple? Oh, no, 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 no. And the reason was because the purple, the color purple is associated with funerals. And this is why they did not think of putting purple in a plate. No, no. I said, well, excuse me. You come in here with your tongues purple because you're eating jamun. 
right? You drink the jamun drink. You buy the purple colored soft drinks. So what's wrong with that? Still, no, 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 no. Anyway, that I, I left them with an idea in their mind, a concept that if they wanted to pursue, they could create menus based on color. Now, the application again of, um, of art education, wider um, application, sports. I used to watch the boys kicking a ball around in the, um, in the yard, the, the, the field for a term. And then the second term I went to the headmaster and said, I would like to run um, to do coach the boys in soccer. He said, why did you wait so long? I said, because I was observing the boys who like to kick the ball and observing what they could do. So I called the boys together and said, I never owned a football, shoes, a ball, played on a team, I just kick around a ball. Now listen to me carefully. Soccer, football is about line and movement on a field. I said, when I'm painting, I'm doing the same thing. I'm looking at the way in which lines and movements of colors and things like that. So that's what we're gonna do. So I applied that principle and it worked beautifully. So that, that led me to believe into this thing that um, it's not about art education, it's really about visual education. And um, the way in which you can use the terms, the equipment and whatever used in art education to apply to teaching in any subject. When I first returned uh, from England and went to the Ministry of Education, they wanted to know uh, which school do you want to go to? I said, I want to go to an infant school. So Mr. Agard, whom I knew, said, what? Several grades, you just come back here with a degree and diploma in art education, you want to go into an infant school? I said, yes. I said, because you have to lay the foundation and that's where it is, the infant school. So I was sent to Barbies High School instead. Anyway, the point I wanted to make to him, which I told him, I said, you know, in education, we talk about um, uh, uh, literacy, literacy and numeracy. I said, I want to coin a new word. It is visual C. I want to coin that term visual C. So it's numbers, letters, and also how to use your eyes. Anyway, that didn't get me anywhere. Visual education and its application. Literature. You talk about the form of a novel. You talk about the form of a poem. You talk about the lines of a poem and how they're divided. Lines and form are terms which are relative to art. So that's, that's in a rhythm as well. Because in poetry, you talk about the rhythm, the metric rhythm. Well, rhythm is also something that is involved in, um, in, in art. The color of a word, the color of a phrase. What kind of colors do a phrase, a certain phrase evokes in your imagination? So that's there where literature is concerned. Um, we talk about, we talk about um, the development of a plot, where you talk about the development of a composition in, in painting as well. You talk about the, the, in literature, about the, the relationship between, between the individuals in the book, in a novel. In a painting, you talk about the relationship between forms and the relationship between colors, the relationship between lines and all the rest of it, relationships. Um, in music, music you talk about the form of a composition. What form does it take? What shape does it take? And there are also particular names in music that relate to those forms and to those shapes. Um, we talk about in music, the color of the voice, a wonderful color. Matter of fact, a certain kind of soprano you refer to as a coloratura. The ones who do that are funny, <laughs> you know, the kind of, they're, and those, I mean, that's really a lot of um, technical vocalizations. I mean, you have to know what you're doing. We talk about the coloratura. We talk about a rough tone of a voice. Talk about gravelly tone. The singer, Louis Armstrong, the trumpet and the singer, look at that gravelly voice, which is still, it had a certain texture that made it attractive. It does not, 
in a manner speaking, say beautiful, like the color which you were singer, soprano, but it had a certain attraction to it. The rhythm, of course, the rhythm of music, the rhythm that you see in, in, um, in, 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 a, in a dancer, the rhythm you see coming through in the way in which the conductor conducts the orchestra, there's rhythm there as well. So that's where music is concerned. Mathematics. There are a lot of diagrams which are used that are based on line, geometry, for instance. But then again, too, um, you have charts. And a lot of people you notice nowadays are using charts. How did the dollars going up or coming down and how did the, the COVID is going up or coming up? They use charts. And a number of those charts, they also use colors. Where the material is in a column of color different columns of colors and the colors will say different things, just as how colors say different things in art. You know, you feel sad or water with blues, people sing the blues, yes, yeah, sad, purples, sad. When you want bright and cheery, you go to the yellows, oranges and reds. When you want to feel cool, you go to the greens and that's how it goes. So in maths, you have graphs, in set theory, set theory where you use a lot of diagrams, round circles into, into uh, uh, acting intersecting with one another. Um, percentages, you also use colors to show that. You use what they call the pie chart as well, that pie chart divided up to show you percentages. And they use different colors to show different percentages. So that's uh, the application of color in my, in my, in the, of art and mathematics. In, um, in geography, I love geography because I was able to draw outlines. I was able to put color to use when you have to indicate certain things, um, like countries. And there's a famous uh, thing about um, any map divided up into different countries. You would feel that you have to use a lot of colors. No, four colors is enough to color any map, four colors. When you have to do um, contour maps, drawing of lines, and you use colors to indicate the distances, different feet, how much feet above and below. Um, the lettering, to put in the, the names of places, and you can choose different kinds of letterings, one kind of lettering for mountains, another one for countries, another one for rivers, and so on. Lettering comes into place there. And textures, to show the difference in a map between um, a savanna, a forest, and a mountain. Textures. Uh, biology, botany, that's, that's a must because you have to draw lines to draw diagrams, lines. And you can also use colors in order to show the differences between it, if you're doing uh, the anatomy of a plant or a human being, you use color in order to identify uh, uh, the different parts. Um, the textures, you want, to, you want to indicate the texture for fur or feathers or the bark of a tree. That comes in, into, your, into your biology and, uh, and botany. Now, I personally uh, did that in my own in my own approach to, um, as you say, as an art teacher. So my approach was more about teaching, informing children, produce giving them exercises in which they can use their sense of perception and also to use their skills in drawing or painting or what have you. So as far as I'm concerned, what we should be dealing with in schools is not so much art education, putting art on the syllabus, but it should be visual education. And if we're going to have visual education in schools, it means that you'll have to train teachers in visual education. And the teachers who are being trained do not have to be artists. They have to be aware of these terms which are being used, the way in which these things manifest themselves in, in art or what have you, and also in nature, and the way in which these things can be transferred and used in all of the subjects that they're teaching. So I had fun in teaching because that's what I used to do. But since I had to teach, I had to teach um, uh, arithmetic in the second form. I used to illustrate 
problems in arithmetic by drawings. The lesson on time. So Muddy gets up in the morning, they spend seven, uh, seven and a half minutes to brush their teeth and uh, uh, 10 minutes of breakfast. They take 15, 20 minutes to ride to school, the bicycle puncture, they need five minutes to repair that. So um, they're supposed to reach uh, their workplace at 8.30 and they left home at whatever. And um, so <laughs> how do you work with the various things, you know? So I actually had a line drawing on the blackboard. I showed the person in the house, showed him on the bicycle, showed him on the way they have to go to work and so on and so forth. So by visualizing it, visualizing it made sense to me because I'm a visual person. And I find it very hard to deal with numbers. Numbers, big problem with numbers because it's hard to visualize the various connections and I have to make it on a diagram to see it. When I was actually um, studying for examinations, visualization came into it because in studying, I used to draw line diagrams in order to understand a play or to understand a novel. And by drawing, making a line chart, a flow chart, I could understand the relationship at a glance. And I found that so very useful that when I was doing my geography and my history and literature, I used to use the same thing. I use a flow chart. And my, my flow chart is in my mind as well, my imagination. And so when I come to write, I can bring up that flow chart visually into my mind and use it. So that is where uh, um, visual education is really, is really uh, uh, very, very important. But the perception of art and its activities within the general population is not very high. And for a very simple reason, because we are not exposing children to visual education which in turn will involve them having to do a little painting, a little drawing, which means that when they see the work done by artists, they will have some understanding of what that person is trying to do. The artists in Guyana are left on a limb because people do not understand what they are saying. And then most they'll say, oh, yeah, the picture looked nice or I like the picture. But if you ask for the questions, you will not get an answer. It says, well, it is the texture, the shape, the forms, the composition, how you use your lines, how you use it. You will not get that. And that will not happen until some form of visual education is in the schools. Dennis Williams opened the, the, um, the Borough School of Art. It was the same year that I was appointed as in charge of the Division of Creative Arts at the University of Guyana. Now, my intention at the University of Guyana was not to train artists. I wanted to try to get the subject out to as many students as possible so that when they entered into the world of work, into the wider community, they would have an understanding of what artists are trying to do and provide the support for the artists. Dennis and I, we had our discussions and this, I told him this is what I'm doing, I'm not teaching art. That is the that is the, 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 the thing of the for the art school. That is the province of the art school to teach art. Children to become people to become artists. Those are the ones who have the ability to do it as well. My program at the university failed. And I realized why it failed too late. I should have remained at Queen's College because of reaching a wider group of children and getting them involved in what art is about. At the university. Students were not interested. I had very few students. Um, the vice chancellor, when I had a discussion with him about it, said that he had thought perhaps that I, I could be artist in residence. I said, but that is exactly what I am. I, I am artist in residence. I'm doing artwork. You see, the students who came to the university had had no kind of um, interaction with art in, the, in, their, um, in their respective schools. And so, the few that I attempted to teach, and I say attempted, I was really teaching them at secondary school level and not at university level. That is what was going on. When I went to Barbados, I was at the, um, the Barbados Community College and 
And one of the methods that I have always found very useful was what I had discovered later on was known as the Socratic method. And what was that? That you teach by asking questions, not by throwing materials at people. I ask questions. How do you do this? And why are you doing that? The result was that I discovered at the community college at that time that a number of people who were there studying art should not have been there. So they were there because of an ability, but the material that should be informing those abilities, that material was missing. So they can draw and they can paint, yes, but what do you draw and why? What do you paint and why? Big questions. So as I said before, the training of teachers for a visual education program is different for the training of those who are going to be teaching art. The teachers for visual education do not have to be artists. They have to be exposed to the materials and the methodology used by artists and to be able to use those methods in whatever other subject they become involved with, because then it, it gives them an expansion of their equipment, of their tools to bring to that subject. So this is where I talk about the application. The application is something that goes outside of the classroom. It goes into your own environment. This is where the, the link between what I spoke about before on awareness. Awareness transferred into the visual arts, but then awareness taken from the visual arts into the wider community. And this wonderful teacher, uh, Hilton Lewis, from Hilton Lewis, he's now 103 years old. And this was at um, the, the Campbellville governor. I went to Hilton's classroom Hilton's classroom had a window blind. His desk had a tablecloth. The classroom had linoleum flooring. So I said, Hilton, what's going on here? <laughs> he said, well, these children come from poor families and the homes they live in, sometimes you do not want to describe those homes. So I'm exposing to the children the very simple things that they can do in order to make their homes beautify their homes. What a teacher. Uh, Joe Benjamin, who was quite a character, one of the brightest, I must say, one of the brightest uh, uh, minds produced in Guyana, who, who died uh, uh, relatively young. And um, I think we lost um, a very valuable contribution uh, to Guyana. So Joel liked uh, uh, drawing and he was a very fine painter as well, but he was nearsighted. So instead he painted without his glasses. And so he's able to bring some incredible details into those paintings. He liked caricatures, he liked to draw caricatures. So he used to do caricatures of the um, members of the library and what they were up to and what they were doing and circulate them and <laughs> that got into trouble. So, and, um, so that image is about the use of line, the way in which a line can be used in such a manner that it produces something that is very expressive, conveys meaning, and it also creates feeling. So it's broken lines, not a continuous line, they're broken lines, and those broken lines also produce a certain kind of visual texture. And then again, the way in which he has drawn uh, me, the, the caricature, it also shows you the movement of line in the way it, which, in the way in which it delineated the figure. So you get this curving line that also helps to indicate shape. And the way in which the textures were produced also helps to indicate its three-dimensional form. So that's a wonderful example of the use, the way in which line, uh, line can be used. Uh, the Shadox is, a, is, a, is um, an example of tonality because the colors in that painting is basically one color, the green. And I'm using it to produce different shades and tints of green. 
to produce that painting. So by monochrome, if you think in terms of music, you're somebody like an opera, you're somebody saying, and the priest also does the same thing, church. That's a monotone. And its equivalent in painting is a monochrome, where you use one color and you use that color in tonalities. Now, a color mixed with white is a tint. A color mixed with black or gray is a tone. A color, you can add gray to a color, for instance, in order to, to, uh, to lessen the vibrancy of the color. It's not a pure color. So you have a pure color, you have its tint, the color mixed with white, and you have its tone, the color mixed with gray or black. So that's what that painting is talking about, monochrome tonality in music. A little boy many, many years ago who saw a version of that painting, which was more colorful than that one and less dramatic, he said, oh, I like that painting. And she asked him, why? He said, that painting is about a man who's returning home from the office uh, to his wife. So the reason was, why the man? Well, he's wearing a tie. So he's working in a, and he has a pencil in his, in his tie he's wearing an office. I thought that was great. So I actually gave him that painting. I also liked the painting. I decided I would like to do a version for myself. But I, I wanted to have, the, taking his, what he said about that painting, I wanted to make this second version and final version more dramatic. So in order to make it more dramatic, I had to paint it in a monochrome. Because you know, if you see a Dracula film in black and white, it's totally different to a Dracula film in color. It does not have the drama. So the drama comes in those shading, that shading, you know, that tonality, those tones, drama. So that's why I did the second painting for myself and I did it as a monochrome um, because I'm stressing tonality. For the Miners by Milton Harris, um, now that is a painting that involves rhythm, rhythm in music, rhythm in poetry, rhythm in verse speaking, rhythm in walking. Look at the person who's doing hurdling. If you do not have a sense of rhythm, you're not going to be a good hurdler. Boxing, look at Muhammad and Ali used to dance in the ring. Sugar Ray Robinson who danced in the ring. Rhythm, so that, that's a painting about rhythm and you can see it. The lines and the shapes, no forms because it's not three dimensional, it's shapes, it's flat. So the shapes and the edges and the lines will create that sense of rhythm. But apart from the rhythm in that painting, there's also tonality. That painting is virtually monochromatic. And so it's done deliberately because I wanted to get the drama of miners who have to go and dig holes in the ground or go and uh, dig a hole or go into a cave or something looking for gold or diamonds. Um, it, was, it was an illustration or not really an illustration, but my reaction to um, passages in Wilson Harris's Sorrow Hill, which involved miners. So you, have, you can have the drama in a painting, you can have drama in the novels, drama on plays on stage, drama in music, Beethoven symphonies, drama. Yes. You, you go to Bach, uh, um, Bach, you're talking about textures. Uh, Bach's music is about textures, the way in which these various lines interweave, musical texture. Yes, so that's minors. Natasha and, and the others, they used to see me practicing calligraphy and doing work in calligraphy at home. And they all want, ah, we want to do this. I said, okay. So, <laughs> so they, they learned to do calligraphy um, at home. And so one day going through their books by chance, well, nothing happened by chance really. I saw this page in Natasha's book where in her handwriting class, because they had handwriting class, she decided that she was going to do a bit of calligraphy. And because she was writing about the pig, <laughs> all of the letters had this little curly tail attached to them, which I thought was really hilarious. So calligraphy is about handwriting and also about lettering. And so in my, in my um, teaching in schools, I used to do both. In calligraphy now, they're handling shapes because you have to get those shapes right. They all have to work together properly. 
And then you can also become inventive and you can also create your own form of calligraphy, which is what Natasha did, you know? So that is a case of using um, lettering and handwriting classes and allowing, piece, pe that, allowing people to develop their own script, their own system of writing, either informal or formal. Now the old string band is again about a different use of line because here the outlines of the figures, they have shape. Those outlines are shaped outlines. They're not a single straight line that you would, that you would expect. And so those shape lines now develop a rhythm of their own. But they are lines because they are outlining figures and they're giving the shapes of those figures which have, which have been outlined. But here's a case where a line is no longer a line, it has developed into a shape. So it's a kind of ambivalent thing. But those who are into metaphysics will tell you that no such thing as a line exists. A line is an imagined form. I mean, it's something that is imagined. A line does not exist. So when you draw a line, it's not really a line because it has a diameter. It has a thickness, like a spider web, 0 0.00 of an inch, yeah. Oh, Eldorado's bread is about form. It's part of a series I did, the Eldorado sculptures, a whole series I did of different things belonging to Eldorado, but that's another story. So this is Eldorado's bread, and you can see the gold at the edge of it, it's Eldorado's bread. And um, it's an essay in form because it's sculpture. The bread itself is a total form. And that, that could have been exhibited all by itself, total form. But me being me, I had to add other dimensions to it. So the other forms associated with that are the, the square cubes, which in my imagination, I call lollipops. People say lollipops, say yeah, square lollipops, why not? So, but it's a square, they're square forms, they're more uh, uh, geometric in order to draw a comparison with the organic shape of the bread. So you have a, a bit of tension going on there. Tension. Now you get tension in physics, tension in mathematics. It's a bit of tension going on there. Tension in drama, tension in singing. So that's an idea of how tension can be created using a, a, a three-dimensional forms. And that loaf of bread is actually in memory of my mother because every Saturday she would make bread looking like that. Or the citadel. That's okay. Um, in contrast to the bread, now that is a complex form. In totality, it's a complex form because it is made up of different forms. But then one has to put those different forms together in order to create unity and harmony. So that question of unity and harmony also comes from the visual arts. Different tones, different tones, the different shapes. Like the different scales you use in music, different scale, different forms, different shapes. And they're brought together in order to form a single unit. Now it's a different thing, it's complex, and it is not like the simple form of, of the bread. So you'll have complex rhythms in poetry and you have simple, simple rhythms as well. Simple forms and complex forms. The sonnet in poetry is some sonnet, complex form. You know, the, 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 the simple poems like, like um, Wordsworth, um, The Flower, uh, the, the Lucy, I think the Lucy poem, simple poems, yeah, simple form. Haiku, Japanese poems, the haiku poems, simple form. Magic pepper plant, yes. Um, I used to go to Border Market. I like string about in Border Market. And, um, and uh, I noticed once that um, there was a strange pepper plant that had peppers of various colors on it. Purple, red, yellow, green. I, said, I asked the person what they said. Yes, it's a decorative plant. You eat it, it's so well, you could if you want. But most people use it as a decoration. So I bought one and I kept it. I liked it so much, I did a painting. The original painting is in Cuba. It is one of my favorite paintings because it's one of my favorite plants. So I decided to do a second version. The second version that you're seeing is definitely more dramatic because of how the painting is composed. It's very much more dramatic. And um, rhythms, you see the rhythms of the leaves, 
You see the rhythms of the colors. The leaves have shapes because they're lines and you see the use of line for the leaves. But where the, where the, the peppers are concerned, they're blurred, the edges are blurred because I want to convey the feeling of a form rather than a shape. So if I had put outlines around the, 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 um, the, pepper, the peppers, it would have presented a shape like the leaves. So by leaving it without outline, it's fuzzy. So it provides, I hope, it provides the sensation of a form. And you can fill in the lines, the lines for yourself. So then the, 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 um, the painting is, is giving us something like, like, like the conquer point, like in Bach's music. It's a conquer point, a play between shapes and forms, shapes and forms, shapes and forms. And they go throughout, it goes through the painting. And it also provides a certain rhythm because you get peppers on one side, leaf on the other side, peppers on one side, leaf on the side, left, right, left, right, until you go to the top or the apex and which is the conclusion. You know, you know, in music, you have a coda, you, you come to the end, that's the end, the conclusion. And so the three little leaves at the top there, that's the conclusion of the whole movement of left, right, left, right. So it's the painting has all the complexities we're talking about. Lime, shape, color, texture, forms, conclusion, rhythm. Resonance is all about rhythms. The way in which the lines cross and intersect and, and um, repeated. So if you go up the painting from bottom to top or top to bottom, you can see that there are passages, there are horizontal passages, which really look the same, but there are little variations in each one. So there's a continuous continuity in, in, the, in the horizontal passages. The horizontal passage, if you examine each horizontal passage, they contain the same elements but the same elements have variations within them. So it's like when you do um, a piece of music, you have the statement and then you have the variation on the melodic line. It's the same thing going on, the same thing going on there. Uh, the thing with paintings like that is that um, you can go on forever. It's infinity, you know? And this is one of the things about artists who are working in one particular idiom you just keep doing variations of it. And so it becomes predictable in a manner of speaking. Visual education creates a kind of unity because you are discovering and applying links which can apply to your studies, your activities in any other area. It involves you with your natural, environment, your social environment, and your own environment, both internal and external. That's what it does. So to my way of thinking, uh, visual education leads you in an indirect manner into metaphysics, the studies, thinking about your own being. Who are you? Where are you? And what are you about? <clears throat> and those are questions which personally I feel have no answers, but they do lead you into very interesting discoveries about yourself. Thank you.